Thank you. We're back on a different bill on H96, which is our bill that was uh, a proposal for a task force to consider a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And we've had some fairly general conversation about this and a lot of conversation in the Social Equity Caucus about this bill and with others. Um, Representative Bloomley and Kalaki have been meeting with a bunch of different um, individuals, stakeholders, if you will. And we haven't really started a, a larger conversation on H96 yet. And um, people are, people are um, starting with curious about it, about what does it mean? Um, the state's never really embarked on a process like this before. And so there's an issue of, um, sensitivity, first of all, about, well, why are we doing this and what would we be doing? What would be the outcome of this and what would be the goal? And, um, and more practically, the question becomes uh, for us, as we start to consider it, how, actually, not so much how do we go about it, we're going to go about it in a legislative way, but also trying to take into account the um, the voices of the people that have been affected that this Truth and Reconciliation Commission as presented as we've been talking about it um, for some of us over the course of the last 12 or 14 months, but um, for others, it's been longer, for others, it's been much shorter. And I, and I wanted to reach out to you, Amanda, and I, we shared the language anyway of H96, which was a short form, which only had the proposal in it. And then the language that we had started last year. And um, one of the questions, I guess I would just start off with is, it, or I'll share a conversation I had with Debbie Ann Page from the Council of State Governments, who, who does sit in on the Social Equity Caucus meetings and, and was integral in, in helping us create that social equity caucus was, um, is it right to even include the words truth and reconciliation in a task force to decide to determine what might come next? I mean, it's easy for, for it's not easy because we've never done it before, but it's the, it's, in the formula of saying, well, how do we approach social equity in the work that we do? Wouldn't a Truth and Reconciliation Commission of some sort be part of the process? And I guess the question that Debbie put to me was, well, should the task force be about, well, what actually comes next? What if one group of people actually only wants certain legislation to, you know, what if one group of people doesn't want or need a Truth and Reconciliation Commission? What if another group of people do you know, how do we accommodate? And so I wanted to start our broader outreach and, and certainly a, a committee, anyone can, can chime in, but John and, and Representative Kalaki or Bloomley, you know, certainly with the conversations you had, feel free to chime in as well. But I'll just start, Amanda, first of all, to welcome you back. And, um, and, and we, we view your experiences um, and, and the Human Rights Commission's role in, in working with, um, I don't even know if it's situations like this, but very difficult situations. And I just wanted to start by asking you, like, what is, what in your opinion might be a path forward for us? I mean, we're, we're gonna start a process with a eugenics apology and one of the notions that I've been working with in my head, based on the research that I've done over the years, is that once you, when you apologize, it can either be just words and really empty, or it can do something, or it can be the beginning, the springboard of something else. And none of those other things are promised per se because it's a legislative process, but we're not going to just apologize and leave it on the table. And I just... It's kind of a broad question to you, but what 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 do you see or as a path forward for us as we contemplate what I view as some pretty important ideas um, this session? Thank you, and thank you so much for having me today, Dan. Um, and and I appreciate having um, today representing the voice of the Vermont Human Rights Commission. 
Um, and I think, I mean, I think centering the voices of the people is always very important. And I know that um, your committee is always trying to reach out to people from the communities that this will impact. I am, I'm, I'm really happy that the eugenics apology is gonna move forward. Is it? Is it gonna move forward? <laughs> um, we ex we expect it to. Yes. <laughs> so so and I think that you're right that that is a first step. Um, I was just uh, listening to Chief Stevens when he came to testify here before, um, and I think it's it's important. It's an important step, but not the end, right? It, it's just like you said. I think these all of these processes need to have that trans transformation piece in that. Um, I talked a little bit about transformative justice and what how that looks like last time that I came here. And, and so I think it's the process. And I think, you know, going also by just thinking about inter the intersectionality approach of it and how intersectionality as a theory, like you, you still have the separate culture background that binds us together, right? Like that is very specific if we're talking about reparations in the black community, if we're talking about um, the harms that were done by to the indigenous community and the harms that were done to the disability, to people with disability in our state, right? And um, in our country. So I think, I think those are separate and distinct things that have happened that we have historical markings for it that to this point, we're still kind of you know, um, talking about it. So it's kind of like time to to start that action. So, and, and with that said is in the legislative process to is thinking about, well, who is on that table? And that's, I think the most important thing is like who is going to be at, you know on that table and looking at the H96 of last year and, you know, um, looking at the stakeholders that were, were put in um, it, it's great, but and again, that's the question of how do you create a system that really respects the, the different oppressions that have happened and how everybody's gonna have a different response to what they want, whether it's reparations, whether it's uh, land, whether, you know, it's, so I think that in a way what I am offering today is something that you already said that, you know, there is some important separations that need to happen so that people can bring on their own cultural um, awakening, the, their cultural empowerment about how they want these reparations to be and, and be able to submit that. And I think so with this bill and you know, like how, I, I believe that it should still be the huge component of it, the truth and reconciliation because we do need to, we need to bring the truth and then and then ask ourselves, oh, how do how would we repair this harm together, right? For our state. So, I mean, I think you already heard from so many other people as well that there needs to be that people need to speak for themselves. That's the big part. And in choosing that who's gonna be there is just leave it for the people that are doing the work on the ground. And I mean, uh, the reparations um, task force in Burlington, the HRC had a space. We we you know found someone that could represent the HRC in that in that moment. So uh, in that space as well. But that answer the, your general question, I answer with general answers. <laughs> no, that's that's right. And and so um, and so we're one of the intellectual pieces of this for me is that we are um, the legislature. So we give us, we create the space and we have a certain kind of time frame, right? Because mm -hmm. whether it's crossover, whether it's the end of session, whether it's crossover next year, um, which it can be uncomfortable when we're talking about trying to create a space for people that, you know, that, that where their voices can be heard in a meaningful way. And that might lead to, um, that might lead to the next steps. And so when, when we're asked, um, we've been asked to take our time 
Because not only is it like giving people voice, part of giving them that voice is saying, we're ready to talk mm -hmm. or we're not ready to talk. Mm -hmm. And so um, given that on one hand, I feel pressure to get something done mm -hmm. because it's the right thing to do, balanced with, but we're not ready to talk perhaps. Um, what is there, I mean, it's, it's not, there's not a textbook answer I know, but I'm just, yeah. you know, I'm just looking for that, for that balance of, of, um, respectfully having that conversation and working within a system that is problematic at its core or by its definition. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 it's, um, I think that, yes, there, there's always a step that we need to take and be bold. And I think when we're talking about the systems and the harms that were done, we need to start moving a little bit bolder around like, if we're really committed to do it, let's just do it. And I think that the, so part of it, like the process is the most important thing. And this is the beginning of the process. You don't need a product right now. The product will come when the when the people are ready, but you need to set the, the process that is if like, so that th this is the way I'm thinking, like you set up the process, you pass this bill, people come in to start to brainstorm. And, that's, and, and that is what we need right now. If we wait one more year for some people to speak and others are ready, some others are not, but you know, there is a movement that speaks to the now, to the let's move things forward now, and the process will speak for itself, I think. You know, part of a white supremacy culture tenant is product over process, right? But process is what really what, what is gonna bring the birth about what needs to happen uh, for us to really get to where it needs to be. And I, so I think that if because we are a few days before crossover that we've been having these conversations now for three years. Some of us, you know, for more, some of you for much more than that, um, that let's just move the process forward and there will be, and I think that you're not setting up the truth and reconciliation product now that is gonna come out, out of the people that are doing the work that are impacted that can speak about what they need and want. And I mean, we we have seen committees that work with subcommittees. So it doesn't necessarily mean that you're, you know, putting everybody together. You could be like the, the process again. And we have really great people in our state that I am sure have all the capabilities love for this work that can create a process that is sustainable, that grounds the voice of the people that you know, we're doing this for, um, and that can really make a difference. So that's my my opinion. Okay, question from Representative Bloomley. Thank you, um, Chair, and thanks so much for visiting the committee. Um, I, I guess, <clears throat> I guess I want to ask a baseline question, which is. Um, Is an apology meaningless if not accompanied uh, by a, or is it diluted, an apology that commits itself to legislative action? Um, uh, is it <clears throat> without companion legislation to take that first next step? Is its meaning uh, diluted? To you, I, I've heard different things in different discussions. Um, and I think that my, um, I, I completely agree with you about process being critical. Um, our committee has <clears throat> um, I think heard, or at least members of our committee and meeting um, 
our chair and John Kalecki and I have heard different things from different people with whom we've spoken to better understand what might be desired. Um, and, um, and so, <clears throat> uh, and there was also some discussion of white supremacy culture is an urgent one. <laughs> and there's always a decide, you know, desire to fix something. Um, and are we maybe moving too quickly? So I, that was several kind of questions there. Thank you. I, I um, you know, it, it's, it's specifically with the eugenics apologies, I just, I, I feel like the people that were impacted are the ones that should be speaking whether or not, you know, an apology is enough as, 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 as me, I would say that that apology is not enough if there is no transformation for it and, and how that looks like. So like, um, but again, like it should be our Abenaki community, like being able to answer that questions and our, our um, and I know that we heard from, from people like Max that came to speak a little bit around that. And I think that, yeah. I think that there should always be attached to a next step. It doesn't again have to be like now we're gonna do all that, but it's like the impact, right? Like when we we are learning all this work around um, apologies and around intention versus impact, and right now we're talking about the impact and how that happened, and so like how how to resolve that issue. So, so I went all over, but the answer to your questions is I think that. There should be something attached to it, but I also want to give um, this should be something that is not that, that is the Abenaki community speaking. And yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, Representative Kalaki, Lynn Parsons. Thank you, and good morning, Amanda. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. Thank um, you. You know, I, I, we are grappling with what is the next step forward and what does it mean? And, um, you know, what we're looking at as a task force, not to necessarily define a truth and reconciliation committee, but to determine what it would be. Um, I, I, I'm really wondering, and, and maybe it's more of a, a session that, I wonder if this is more of a hybrid model with the legislature, your, your office and Susanna Davis's office. And because, that this is a lot, this is very important for the state to do, and it's really important that it's correct. And I think, uh, you know, just trying to, to figure out this process and what the financial support is for this process, you know, uh, Rep Blumley and I have heard from people saying, well, we're all volunteers. This is really hard to set up meetings with us over the summer to get a report together about this because no one's, you know, this, we all have other jobs. And so I'm just thinking, it, um, I think I'd like to sit with you and Bore, yeah, and, and uh, Blumley and, and then bring this back. To, if, is there a different model? You know, we, we have a, a summer study committee, you know, is a model the legislature sets up or a, a process. And, you know, we, we have a lot of deep listening to do with a lot of different stakeholders to determine what, what their issues are in this and what the harm is from their perspectives, not from our perspectives. And so my, I, I just can't get my arms around what a process would look like. And so I, I don't know if, if you'd be willing to sit and brainstorm, is there some connection with your office, with Susanna Davis's office and with the legislature? Um, I, I know it's, 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 we, and the apology, we are apologizing for what the state did. So it is ultimately our responsibility. I'm not trying to mm -hmm. give up our responsibility, but I'm just feeling like this is pretty important and, and due process is really, and we, you know, we have to start it. We don't have to finish it in, in one little summer committee. So I think that's where I'm struggling how to start. 
Yeah, and I'll be, I'll be more, yes, I am here to support, uh, HRC is here, the Vermont Human Rights Commission is here to support um, all the way, and yeah, we, we can set up a, a, a meeting with Susana, and part of like the, the initial H96 from last year, I mean, all of the systemic racism pieces is work that she's going, she's uh, working on, all, all of the, the work that her office is doing around systemic racism and, and finding and that the HRC is doing um, in some of it. So I think that a connection to it is really important and I'll be more than happy to talk, but yeah, we're here to support. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Representative Parsons. Thank you. I just had a question that's more of just a understanding type question. Uh, the term white supremacy culture has been used a few times around this um, regarding different aspects. Um, and your example was product over process is a white supremacy culture thing. Does process over product belong to any supremacy culture? Or is it just, it, it just seems that it's, I'm not sure, it just seems like a personal trait kind of thing as, a, as opposed to being given any one culture. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, representative for that. So the white supremacy culture is, um, it's, it's a document that many, many of us have um, been drawing from that was created by um, these two amazing educators that kind of like the, ten, the tenant of white supremacy it's in its hell is that uh, white folks believing that they are above anybody else. And um, so there is a, is a kind of line of study that, that has been happening around our state in, in many spaces around, um, specifically around white supremacy culture of how like people of color have not given their words uh, to speak for themselves. And and these also and, and just that the procedures that have been created um, to not allow for people of color and people from other marginalized communities to come and speak, being agents of change, and and what the processes are. And so there's a shift to, shift in some of those um, things around perfectionism, around like how everything has to be perfect, and and process. There's a and I can't I will be more than happy to share the document with you that talks a little bit about just those tenants and, and, and the shift for that. Um, that is less of a rigid system where we can actually be humans together um, instead of like this um, kind of a standards that have been set that in, in man, many times what that has done is um, continue to oppress people that who were, whose voice were taken away. And I'll be happy to share that document with you. Yeah, I guess I was just trying to square the circle of if product over process is white supremacy culture, does process over product automatically become something that we tie to another culture? I don't. So a culture we're trying to create together where all the voices are listened to maybe. Okay, I guess I'll leave it at that, thank you. Thank you. Okay, hey, Representative Bloomley. Yes, um, <clears throat> I've been following different pieces of legislation that um, related to social equity that are in different committees um, in both the House and the Senate. And, and I've just been, this is a kind of a broader question, but it, 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 it might affect our work here on this, which is, you know, is, is there, <clears throat> it feels a little to me like a patchwork quilt um, uh, approach or a, a somewhat piecemeal approach to address um, similar um, uh, issues um, in different ways through different means. And that may be what has to happen, um, you know, whether it's the data collection or it is related to healthcare equity or it is related to reparations or, is, and um, I, I just wonder 
about discussions you, you know, and your colleagues have had or um, uh, or you've had with Susanna Davis about is there any reason to try to align or integrate these, um, you know, these efforts? Um, and are there opportunities that would, um, uh, I apologize for not being clearer. Uh, do you, do you, are, are you understanding where I'm going here? I, Is, I, <clears throat> I think so. I, I'm just conscious of the fact we're doing this here. These other people are doing things in other places. And are there opportunities um, over, over time for some alignment and strengthen um, our efforts? Yeah, and I mean, I, 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 I think so. And I think part of the, the Susanna Davis office is going to work on that, right? Like she just started, what, two years ago? So it's like, she's like thinking her job is to end systemic racism in that state, which is huge, right? And so I, and I think that they already gave us recommendations of things that, that can work that ultimately will help us see the big pictures and, and align. So I will defer to her because I think it is a great question. Um, she created a task, a symposium of all the task force that the state has. And so uh, those task forces have met, I think, I believe like three times. Um, and just looking at all the things that people are doing with that idea not to redo things that have already been done, you know, reports that have been commissioned uh, to this task force that are looking at racial equity, education, police reform, all of this, and looking at how they all align um, towards the same goal, right, of looking at the disparities in our state. So I think, I think Susanna will be, I know she says fine tomorrow. Um, those are really great things for her that she might already be working on that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, uh, Amanda, the, the, we had an implicit training bias earlier as a caucus of the whole. Um, we have uh, upwards of a dozen bills in our committee right now that in some way, shape and form address issues that fit into the category of social equity um, or social justice. And we haven't really delved into a lot of them past this H96 and the apology. Um, and I suppose we can include minimum wage and th there's a lot, there's a lot there. And I'm curious to know if there is a way for us to take time not this week, not next week, but sometime in the near future to kind of have another training with you um, and with others just to, again, to, to try to um, identify way best, best practices on how to, to start work on some of these bills. I mean, obviously we're not gonna to get to all of them, but we they have all come out of conversations um, obviously they're important to somebody enough to try to get them, mm -hmm. um, sponsored. Is that something that we can request? Um, I mean, we would, we would probably need to figure out what that means for our committee. Like, what is it that we want to, what is it that we would want to talk about with you or in, as a training, mm -hmm. um, but is, is that something that you would be able to work with us on? Yeah, I would love to. I will love that. Um, and also, I don't know, have you guys seen the tool that Susanna and her office created around like policy and equity? Um, I, we may have seen it individually in places, but I can't recall seeing it myself. I, I will ask her to send it, but um, I, I think that that's a, a really important tool because he asked all this question around equity and around all the policies and bills that are being worked on um, and they use it in in their office. So 
but I would love to yeah work with your committee and um, set something up. Great, because I mean, one of the things, again, remaining sensitive to language, um, we would, we need to be working from the same glossary, I think. And, and I hear this in all of our work, but again, in relation to this bill, um, mostly offline, it, language is important and understanding what these things mean are important. And I think it would be important for us to address these in a much more specific way than just the training that we received um, as a caucus of the whole. Um, but the committee will, and I will have, you know, we'll have that conversation in, in the near future. But I just, I just, as, as, I, as I was feeling lucky to get you here for today, I was, you know, thinking that in the future, again, as we take up bills like this, even even 96, um, how do we how do we make sure our language is correct? Um, and I'll also just be happy to give a 15 minute overview of what the HRC does um, for representatives that are new, uh, just because we we do have um, a huge, you know, play. Um, a plate full of things <laughs> that of all of our protected categories. And so when I'm speaking, um, who I'm speaking for, not for, but you know, the, the work that we have is for all the protected categories, which includes race, ethnicity, gender. And so that will be also helpful um, of where we come from when we're speaking of the HRC. That would be great. And we, this, this, this Zoom world has prevented us in some ways of just having our HRC 101 or our, um, in, in, in our 101s in a lot of different categories here in the first half of the first year of the session. So, um, but we will, we will be sure to um, be in touch soon. And, and I, I appreciate you taking the time just to sort of tee this up or get share and share your thoughts. Well, thank you now. for yeah, and, and, you know, feel free if you notice here and there that we're going down the wrong alley or the right, you know, just if you, if you know, if you notice things that we don't, please feel free to share them, um, at least with, with any of us that you come across, um, I'd say in the hallway, but we're not there yet. So. <laughs> soon, soon. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you so much for your time today. Yep. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Bye. Be good. Thank you. Thank you. You too. All right, committee. That was some kind of morning. Um, in general, housing and military affairs fashion. Um, Representative Murphy. Thank you, Chair Stevens. I'm going to wrap us back to when we very early began voting on H149. And as I look at the instructions for what I'm to do with it, there's one requesting that, um, speaking to amendments to it, and we didn't deal with the amendment. And so I don't know how to cope with that. Um. Cause it says if the, if the bill is being voted out favor, fav, favorably, no amendments yeah. proposed by the committee, but we are proposing an amendment and we didn't vote on it. It was, the motion was favorable with amendment. So that's all we say? Yes. Yeah, so the work that by adding language on top of what was in the bill is introduced, that's, that's, that's the amendment we made. So we we made that amendment in the in in the process of discussion on the bill. Okay. I think what I think what's going to appear in the in the book is probably just the amendment or a link to the amend you know to, to to some of the language or it could be to the whole bill. But regardless, it's not. We didn't do a strike all. Usually, what happens is you know if there's a lot of changes, we do a strike all, and you can. But I think it's still the same process. You're right. We didn't have a separate amendment. For the employment rights. Yeah. 
And so that's so maybe so maybe reach out to Damien and ask him how it's how he thinks, or maybe the clerk, um, you and Ron can reach out to the clerk and see how it's going to appear in the calendar. I'm and I'm, then, I'm sorry, I stand corrected. I'm looking at the summary, and it does include the section seventy two and seventy three. So you're right; it it would be as amended. We we yeah. tucked it in. Yeah, yeah right. it was inserted language. Yep. Yeah. 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 Right. Okay. I did ask Damien, and he said, just send the amendment to the court, to the house. Yeah. Court. Okay. Yeah. Thank so that people, so people can refer to, people can refer to the bill as introduced because we didn't change anything in it. And then there's that amendment that we did add. Okay. Um, all right. Clear as mud. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, everybody. So we are on the floor at 1 p.m. and um, huh? 1 15. 1 15. Um, and just keep an eye, as we discussed yesterday, just keep an eye on your texts from Ron. Just, I mean, obviously, if we are past a certain time, you know, we'll find out from the witness how long he's available. But, um, it, what his flexibility is uh, after a certain point. And I, if we are able to meet with him, I suspect it could be, a, you know, a, a half an hour to 45 minutes would be probably um, the most we would get. I mean, we usually, when we've met with this group before, with, with Colonel Cooney before, we've rarely gone over an hour with him, but um, just, keep it, just keep an eye out. Um, and Ron and I will work on tomorrow. Tomorrow we clearly need to meet at nine o'clock on um, we, so homework will be definitely take a look at the rest of one, the last couple of pages of 157. Um, be prepared to make some quick conversation and decisions if we can on 313 when that information comes across. Of course, if we can't find comfort, a comfort level on voting for something, we'll, we'll pass until the next time. Um, and and um, that'll be, that'll be the, the thrust of tomorrow, along with conversation with Susanna Davis. Could, could we try to um, get the representative of the retailers in just to have an understanding of that or? Yeah, we Ron is going to work on contacting Erin Segrist to see Great. if she has an opinion. Uh, I have sent an email. And so um, we'll see how she responds. Thank you, Ron. Sure. And I do think, I mean, I do think the question, Barbara, that you raised earlier, whether, you know, is this a consumer bill or is this a manufacturer, you know, a business bill? And I think, you know, including second class people could be considered a consumer bill because supermarkets supermarkets certainly haven't struggled during covid um from a business perspective um and that's a different that's a different thing rather than saying specific to the businesses that are the the manufacturers or um i mean small businesses I, you know i know that the the, the small local store in, in huntington has struggled this year but that's um they also don't do curbside. So um, anyway, we'll see what we get from Aaron Segrist and um, go from there. <laughs>